Okay, we'll get started. Thanks everyone for uh, patience. We've been um, talking about doing an event like this for probably close to a year now, I think, um, between Mike Hathorne and uh, John Coppage and I, and um, it was pretty exciting to actually have it happening. So thank you all for coming. I um, look forward to a really great evening of uh, really good discussion, um, trying to <clears throat> tackle some of the biggest struggles but most important things that we can be talking about as a city, and that's um, quality, affordable housing, and um, the role that that can play in creating strong communities. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank our our guests and our, mo our moderator. Um, Dina will be doing the introductions, so I won't uh, duplicate that. I'd also like to thank uh, our CNU annual sponsors, uh, WSP, Daybreak Communities, and the University of Utah College of City and Metropolitan Planning. Um, we wouldn't be able to uh, function without sponsors, and we're, we're grateful for them. And um, if you're interested in being a sponsor of CNU Utah, come talk to me after this. Uh, just my quick thoughts on uh, this event and the importance of uh, CNU Utah and the role that uh, we, we play is that there are a lot of issues that uh, cut through party lines and are just human issues and CNU really hits on those issues and I think in today's I think it's safe to say we live in a fairly politically divisive time. Um, maybe that's an understatement. But uh, I think there is a large group of people that really are just hungry for uh, solutions-oriented discussion and organizations. And uh, this requires getting people together who um, you don't necessarily agree with talking to people who have views and ideas that uh, maybe um, you, you don't agree with, but still staying at the table and staying engaged because uh, you have the common goal of wanting a great community and a great city, a great region. Um, and so this requires you know, listening, it requires caring about the uh, other, other people and the things that they uh, are, are important to them, even if they aren't necessarily important to you. Um, and we believe that CNU Utah is one piece in that puzzle of helping to fill that void. And, um, you know, we're here to provide nonpartisan, multidisciplinary forums to exchange ideas and set an example for passionate yet respectful debate on challenging issues facing our cities today. Um, and we're grateful that all of you are here to. Um, to participate in that. So one last thing, just a quick plug to sign up as if you're not already a CNU member, to sign up as both a, a CNU uh, member and a, as a chapter patron. The benefits include the ability to uh, combine together with people from a variety of uh, disciplines, including um, students, to work together to improve the way that Utah communities are built, find outlets to um, collaborate with planners, architects, engineers, landscape architects, developers, public officials, and others. Um, if you sign up as a Utah, senior Utah patron, um, you'll, you'll be invited to some patron-only events that we'll be holding, and then also uh, the chapter patrons will be recognized on the CNU Utah uh, website, which has recently been launched at uh, cnuutah.org. So enough of me talking, you didn't come here for me. I'll turn it over to Dina. Thanks, John. I'd like to thank John Larson, who's the chair of our board of trustees at um, CNU Utah. So my name is Dina Blaze, and I'm a former board member of CNU Utah, and really I'm very honored to be asked to participate as a moderator for today's um, event. Um, I do want to take a minute. John already recognized our sponsors. We can never thank them too much, WSP. Um, Daybreak Communities and the Department of City and Metropolitan Planning at the University of Utah. Uh, we'd also like to thank those who are participating with us today. We have an exceptional uh, and really interesting group of experts here today, 
And before we begin, I want to go over just a few logistics for everybody. Um, restrooms are across the atrium down in the basement. Um, please, if you have a cell phone, turn it off. Um, or we can follow the Park City City Council rule, which is if your phone goes off, you buy everybody dinner in the room. So it's up to you. But I think turning it off might be a better option. Um, the Wi-Fi is available if you go to S, you should see it as SLCPL underscore public is the Wi-Fi access here. It doesn't require a password. Um, and our format today, uh, we're going to begin with brief remarks by our panelists, followed by a discussion among them and myself. We'll take about a 10 minute break. Um, and I would encourage you, if you came in, there were some three by five cards and pens. If you want to jot down some questions, we're going to be gathering up those three by five cards during the break. And that's going to sort of usher us into what we hope to be a very robust question and answer period after the break. Um, one thing I should say, there's also going to be a CNU Utah hosted gathering with our speakers after the event over across the way again in the, one of the conference rooms on the other side of the atrium. Um, so let's get started. This afternoon we want to explore the relationship between conservative values and the development of affordable housing. And that of course is a starting point. I don't doubt, however, that the discussion will venture into the topics of wages, government mandates versus the free market, regulatory and land use schemes, the Federal Housing Administration, and the role of urban design, among others. Our title for this event is Delivering Community, Making It Happen in a Red State. We clearly intend to explore these issues within the context of conservative values and ideology. But what do we mean when we say conservative? Generally speaking, we mean values that include decision-making control at the most local level, respect for tradition, custom, and convention, prudence as it relates to long-term consequences of our decisions, disdain for uniformity and a one-size-fits-all approach, the link between freedom and property, limiting government intervention, and the notion that the best solutions are reached voluntarily. Now, undoubtedly, the principles I just enumerated may irritate some of you because I may have forgotten your favorite one, or I hit a, struck a nerve if you don't agree with those principles. So I don't want any emails, you know, citing sort of an American Spectator article that might point out what those principles are. It certainly was not an all-inclusive list. It's just a general understanding of some of the core principles that I think are part of the conservative ideology in the United States and, of course, in Utah as well. But the reality is that CNU Utah is seeking to explore the opportunities and the challenges that are associated with strengthening communities in a red state where we tend to approach those solutions through those filters. We just want to be clear and very upfront and transparent about the context for our discussion today. So our philosophy with this event is also to cover as much ground as possible. We're going to fill the time with a lot of substance. So we have specifically asked our speakers not to go through a primer. I'm going to introduce them. We don't want to spend too much time them introducing themselves and giving you their bona fides, so I'm going to do that. We want to jump right into the topics. And if it's a little bit over your head or you can't, we can't keep up, that's what Google is for. Jot it down, Google it later. But we really just want to focus on substance. So we have asked these three panelists to share with us very briefly five or six minutes of their very strong point of view on these topics. And then we're going to jump into that discussion. So let's get started. Heath Hansen was born and raised in Cache Valley, Utah. He graduated from Utah State University with a bachelor's degree in psychology and law and constitutional studies and a master's degree in political science. He currently works for Senator Mike Lee as a legislative assistant. Prior to that role, he worked on Senator Lee's Joint Economic Committee staff as a policy advisor and helped write the recently released report, What We Do Together, The State of Associational Life in America which I hope he's going to talk about today, right? And currently he lives in Maryland with his wife and two daughters. Next, we're going to hear from Derek Monson, the Director of Public Policy at the Sutherland Institute. He oversees Sutherland's strategic policy and legislative initiatives. He has influenced a variety of public policies in Utah, including tax and spending policy, government transparency, education, Medicare reform, 
and immigration. He's been published in Public Budgeting and Finance, The Washington Examiner, The Federalist, Utah Policy Daily, and of course, our daily statewide publications. He has a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from Brigham Young University, and is completing a master's in finance at the University of Utah. And Jonathan Coppage is a visiting fellow with the R Street Institute, where he studies regulatory obstacles to the traditional walkable neighborhood development patterns that strengthen communities both socially and fiscally. He's a contributing editor to the American Conservative Magazine, where he edited the New Herbs Project before joining R Street. He has also been published in the Washington Post, First Things, and National Review. He's based in Washington, D.C., and has spoken on urbanism and mixed-use development at events across the country, and we're glad you can add Salt Lake City to your list. So let's get started. Heath. All right, well, thanks, Dina. Um, it's always great to come back to Utah. I like to do it every chance I get. Um, so I'm a relative newcomer to housing and urbanism issues. Uh, most of the experience I have with these issues have come in the last few months when I was working, as Dina said, on Senator Lee's Joint Economic Committee staff. So Senator Lee is the vice chairman of the Joint Economic Committee. And earlier this year, he started the Social Capital Project from that office. And uh, we produced our first report just last month called What We Do Together, The State of Associational Life in America. Um, and there are copies up on the table up there. I hope everyone was able to get one. If not, it's available on Senator Lee's website, lee.senate.gov. Go ahead and check it out there. Um, the impetus behind this project and this report is there seems to be a sense that the, um, our social fabric is weakening in America. Um, so often when we discuss politics or public policy, we tend to focus on two extremes. We talk about the individual, we like to talk about individual liberty, and we talk about people being able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, uh, things like that. Or we talk about the state or the federal government. Uh, everything the federal government's doing right, what it's doing wrong, what it should be doing that it isn't, um, things like that. Uh, what we often ignore, though, in our public discourse is the middle layers of society in between the individual and the state. And so that's really what this project is designed to do is to shine a light on um, those intermediary layers of society, these institutions like family and religion, um, communities, neighborhoods, clubs, all the things that fill that space, that civil society between the individual and the state because that's really where our society um, gains its strength and it's where our social fabric is woven is in those intermediary institutions. Um, so that's the perspective that I come at these issues from, um, is more of a sociological perspective. Um, so I'd just like to go over um, a couple of the findings from this, our first paper. What this first paper does is we kind of take a broad view of the state of social capital in America, and we look at four different categories. We look at family, religion, community, and work. Um, we just kind of look at different indicators and how things have changed since the 1970s. Um, just to kind of get a, a snapshot or a, a, an overall view of how our associational life has changed over the past 40 years. And a couple of the findings that I think are pertinent to our discussion today. Um, <clears throat> so American adults are spending less time socializing with their neighbors today than we did in the 1970s. So in the 1970s, 30% um, of American adults reported um, that they had spent at least several times a week socializing with their neighbors. In 2016, that number had dropped to 19%. Um, another interesting finding is that although racial segregation in our communities has fallen, uh, class segregation is increasing. So. In the 1970s, about 65% of American families that lived in the largest metro areas in the country, they lived in what would be classified as uh, middle class neighborhoods. And with the remaining 30, 35% living in either poor or affluent neighborhoods. Um, as of 2014, that had almost flipped. Only 40% of American families lived in middle class neighborhoods, and about 60% occupied the spaces in affluent or poor communities. So we're, 
we're dividing ourselves along class lines now rather than race-based lines as much as we did in the past. And finally, um, another concerning finding is that our social trust, the trust we have in each other, is declining. Um, in 1972, the number of people who said that most people can be trusted um, was at 46%. By 2016, the number had fallen to 31%. And also in the 1970s, um, the number of people who said that they trusted the judgment of the American people with regard to current policy issues of the day was at 83%, and last year that had fallen to 56%. So we're not trusting each other, we're not spending as much time with each other, and we're also dividing ourselves along class lines. And so when it comes to uh, housing policy, um, I think it's important to not only if we want affordable housing, obviously we need to increase the quantity of housing, but we also need to increase the quality of our neighborhoods and the quality of the development. So this is where we talk about missing middle housing, um, where we can provide a bunch of different forms of housing across a bunch of different price ranges in order to integrate our communities a little bit more and also to um, encourage people to get out and associate with one another so we can start building that trust again um, and so we can ultimately uh, heal our, our, our frayed social fabric. Okay. All right. Um, so, I think, uh, uh, very long ago, I said a survey on the issue of saying that uh, people hear most seeing them seeing second, yeah. <laughs> so his joke on this is that we did our funeral, we'd rather be in the past and be in the eulogy. So, uh, without very much of a uh, So, I think, I think where conservatism is about to stand for a while, it begins with the focus or the drive in conservative thinking principles on the reality of the people that, uh, you know, whether it be the document of history or in the world we are in right now. Um, Avoiding abstract things that don't necessarily have attention to the obvious, that it's about what we wish was the case. And so I think there's three areas where uh, I thought I'd like to address when it comes to that. The first is the regulatory space. Uh, so I think you know, in order to have affordable housing, uh, you have to have regulators that limit their, 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 the scope of their action to practical consideration, not the ideological You know, what is, what is this community? Uh, what, what are the people who are in this community? What do they think? Those kind of things, rather than say, uh, you know, what are the ones that are the table? Um, and then, on the same token, allowing markets and communities to really drive processes and regulation of the housing. So we actually had a great example that we met today with a Salt Lake City planner uh, and a fellow uh, just southwest of here, the track station. And you can tell just that when we talk about different developments that are going, different units are being built uh, up our uh, that he saw his job as helping things actually happen in the community uh, based on what the community was like, as well as what the developers of the community were interested in doing within the course of bounds and scope of cities. I think that's a great example of what a regulator should look like. Uh, you know, rather than practical considerations, trying to really facilitate affordable housing options rather than, say, a uh, person trying to walk in real life or a person who wants to stay in their car with this person. Uh, in the developer space, uh, I think there is a lot here, uh, specifically dealing with the community driven solutions. So, uh, I actually spend a lot of my day this afternoon speaking with a developer, a local developer here, and he emphasized that it is right the importance of developers to work with the communities and trying to develop a community or develop a, a housing uh, in. So rather than say, putting up all your plans, figure it all out, going to the city, and then just dropping it on the community in the area when it's about happening to work, uh, or submitting to the process, you start by going to the Show them and surrender. Hey, here's what I want to do. Hold up all the beams so you can understand and you avoid some unnecessary uh, objections of what would otherwise be a good set of housing um, uh, to people feeling 
is this And then you can uh, you know, top of that is building, building our development in ways that respect the more traditional look and feel of the communities we're in, rather than trying to change them. Um, you, see, you see a lot of that uh, in various areas. And that might have a, have kind of a, a bad feeling, right? It looks great, it's, it's new age, uh, but again, a lot of times communities reject it. And rightly so, they don't care about the ways they care about the community. They don't want to And then secondly, uh, those things can quickly go out for the next step of the law. And then I'll close, uh, talking about the little more national, I think in the financial space, there's, there's room for the circuit. Um, it's really pretty cool housing options. And that, you know, we really, despite all the federal or the financial regulations that passed, have a financial crisis. We haven't resolved any of the core issues that drove the financial crisis. Um, we still have a system that is both in the regulatory and in the market space that personalizes the benefits of finance in the housing area and socializes the costs. And so you see that even in the wake of that crisis, skyrocketing housing values uh, is in part really driven by these underlying fundamental barriers. Um, Whereas if you got that right way, as opposed to the backwards, you might have a more reasonable uh, set of total housing options and the cost of housing. And maybe just my closing point would be amidst all of this, I mean, there is a need for a sense of humility about people who really understand when it comes to these issues, whether it be the markets and the regulations. Um, again, the housing crisis, the financial crisis is a great example. We thought we knew everything that was going on, the regulators did. The Agreements did, people buying their homes did, and then we realized we didn't. Uh, it was a lot of pain. Uh, but maybe as a bit more as it is pertinent to the housing sector, you have things, for example, in the technological realm, such as uh, you're familiar with this thing called the hybrid, right? This idea that it is, according to the, the technological developers themselves, is within a handful of years, four, five, six years, of actually transport people. Uh, using their cars. You go into a, into a loop that's maybe going underground, it shoots you at 150, 200 miles an hour on your commute. You come out and you drive to your work. And they will get a regular place to go. And I'm not saying that's going to be a technology that becomes actually practical. Who knows what ends up? But what it should, should suggest to us, I think, is if this kind of technology is going to place, what does that mean for the global health? You could live, say, in Bernie City or Cash Valley and you could solve that completely. That completely changes what we think we understand in, in regards to what the world means and what the problem problem is. And so I think, again, we don't know what's going to happen, and that's the point. It's keeping that in mind as we come up with plans, there's a lot of type of plans in the future, and recognizing that it can be put together and what we expect. Oh, thanks. So thank you, Dina, and thanks, John, for helping put all this together. I've um, very much admired a lot of what's been coming out of Utah, what's been coming out of Senator Lee's office, and the work that they do down at the Sutherland Institute, and so it's a treat to be able to be here. Um, I'll, I promised Dina I wouldn't do a primer, and I won't, but... I will start with the context that I work in. Um, so I work at a think tank in Washington, D.C. And as Dina mentioned, my focus is on um, the walkable sort of traditional urbanism that was time tested and strengthened communities in many ways. And the reasons why we've gotten away from it, um, some of which are free choice and market driven, but a lot of which have been um, substantial government choices. And there's one in particular that I've been working on that shows a lot of how um, small decisions taken from a high place can have cascading snowballing effects for decades and shape the environment in which we live. Um, and one that I work on is uh, mixed use development. Um, we're in CNU, Utah, so I know everybody here is a big fan of some good mixed-use development um, and has probably run into some of the issues of financing 
that development when many of the standard programs, uh, whether at the FHA or through um, you know, Fannie or Freddie, uh, all of the different ways that the federal government has entered the market since the New Deal in order to try and expand affordable housing as an option for people, um, it has done so by picking a particular fashion that it thought was good, which was the single family home. Um, and so we got a lot of that in the post-war period. And we needed a lot of that. We needed a lot of everything in the post-war period. We had you know, a generation coming out of a depression, after coming out of a war, and they needed a place to live. Um, but because they set up these emergency temporary measures in keeping with what they thought was just ideologically, as Derek was mentioning, the best, um, they cut the legs out from under the organic mixed use development that could be built incrementally and that could gather over time, that uh, small actors could build and could have gradual intensification of their towns and places. And so, over the course of 80 years, a lot of that financing dried up, a lot of that development dried up, and that's why the new urbanists came along to wave their arms one day and say, hey, we lost something. How can we get that back? Um, and what I think is really important when we're talking about housing affordability and the built environment, is that a lot of the attention goes straight to the highest possible level. Um, low income housing tax credits and other federal solutions that can be implemented at large scale in a place. They're allocated to the states, which, are, which then uh, give them to you know, pick the projects that can build a lot of these below market developments. And when you look at how housing was built before these went up. There was a lot of it that was affordable by design. And that is one thing, one place that we have gotten away from is building buildings that are designed to be affordable. Of Instead of having um, a standard set of, you know, a single family house on a, a large lot, you have, um, the ability to have, as we saw when we were driving around, a uh, great bungalow court where you have, you know, what was that, eight two-bedroom units, so that 16 people on a single family lot. Those are smaller units. They're able uh, to be afforded. They were able to be built because they weren't illegal yet. Um, and we've gotten away from allowing developers to build that stuff. And when they do, often the only people who build it are the large developers who will master plan um, a very large area. And it's good to have large developers. It's good to have big people to do big jobs. But when we're talking about housing affordability and community, what's really important to me is that you see some of this coming from the local level. And that it is important to have small actors to operate within the bounds of the default that um, where they can develop things by right, where they don't have to hire squads of lawyers to shepherd uh, their little quadplex through, um, and where people can build houses at scale themselves to build for their neighbors. And one of the things I think it's so important to have small scale incremental development is to have that ability for citizens to build for their neighbors, to have, um, to have equity in their place so that you're not relying on um, large actors from elsewhere to determine the future, but rather that individual actors can shape and take equity in the future of their community. Um, Salt Lake City is an interesting place, and as we were driving around, it was interesting to note the it's famed for its blocks. It's, fa it's famed for its streets, and they're huge. Um, they are, in many ways, the opposite of small, but 
And I've gotten into some arguments, as I was telling John, uh, with other new urbanists who say Salt Lake City, it's, it's lost. You, you can't save Salt Lake City. It, the blocks are too big, the streets are too big. You know, too bad, they're nice people, but what are you going to do? And the great opportunity that Salt Lake City has is that it has these blocks which, as uh, we saw one of the developments just going up across the street from those uh, micro units, you can drive, a, drive straight through them and create another street. You can do a road diet like the one on Broadway and it's beautiful and it's fantastic and you have a lot of space to work with. And so, in a lot of ways, I think Salt Lake City in particular has a lot of room to do small things because it has big blocks, big streets, big problems, but big enough to work in. So. Thank you. Okay, one of the things that you all three mentioned that I'd like you to talk a little bit more about is you sort of set out a premise of what some of the challenges were and some of the problems and I know, Jonathan, you have written a lot about what are the specific things that local entities can do to make those changes come about. So I'd like if you could, all three of you, talk a little bit about the more, the greater detail. If Derek, are there specific changes that could be made within the Federal Housing Administration or the lending um, community that might make that difference? And Heath, your mention about the missing middle, and you know, it makes me want to ask is that um, class segregation sort of which comes first? Is it the housing that's causing that segregation? Or is there, are there other elements within the social fabric that your report may have brought up that are just causing us to sort of move in that direction? Is it the political climate and so forth? So what I'd like is you made some good opening remarks and I'd appreciate it if you would sort of now take that next step into the deeper understanding of, of those elements that you raised. Sure. Uh, so I think There are various aspects of, of the regulatory policy that's not uh, changed. So, again, I think, you know, Don Frank is a good thing. It didn't really solve the difficult problems. So, and there are other options out there, the choice I have is to build it as some of the things that are going to do this legislation and so forth. But, you know. but when you don't have policy in place that allow But instead, you kind of leave, leave the situation such that the only way to are going to a crisis and then create a crisis is bigger. Uh, and that's kind of, I think, where Bob Frank is. This would be another example of this. It's an enjoyed economic um, large financial institutions to declare bankruptcy, go through that process, and what is unique for financial institutions, but then prevents the new crisis from spreading because it can be done a reasonable and in a positive fashion for the rest of the system. You know, that day is going down. Uh, rather than what we saw us in the middle of that day, we're going down there, we're going crazy. Uh, so, again, that's a specific example is how we deal with financial institutions that fail. And I think that's important here because there's a lot of risk in financing housing and real estate. That's just the nature of the market. And so, you have to have policies that reflect that rather than, again, socializing it, because we're really not dealing with failing institutions in a way that allow us to reasonably personalize those costs as a way to bring them down now to the level So with the class segregation, there's um, a lot of different factors at play there, obviously. Um, one of the things that is likely causing some of the increase is the mortgage interest deduction, where the federal government um, allows mostly um, higher income earners to deduct their mortgage interest from their home or their homes. And so this benefits um, the people who make more money than um, they can qualify for standard deduction um, while completely ignoring uh, middle class and especially lower class people that either don't earn enough money to take that exemption or they rent and so they don't own their own home. Um, so that's part of what's driving inequality. Um, 
Also, there was a study done by a scholar at the University of California, I believe, Ann Owens, and she looked at the social segregation and what was driving it, and she found that almost the entire, it could almost entirely be attributed to families with children who were moving to more affluent parts of neighborhoods to get into better school districts. So that's, that's the largest driver is what it seems to be as a school district. And then um, obviously there's probably zoning issues there that you, know, you get the affluent people, they move in and they don't want anyone else to move in because they've got a pretty cushy position with their kids and their schools and so they tend to so zone everybody else out. perpetuates that segregation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. but it will, yeah. yeah, and um, as you say, a lot of zoning bakes this in because people want a monoculture of uh, large houses that swell larger thanks to that mortgage interest tax deduction. Um, but there are a lot of ways that you can start, even in small ways, to undo that. And one is accessory dwelling units, which uh, new, new Urbanism has been a big fan of for a long time. And I know that Salt Lake passed an ordinance trying to get some ADUs started a few years ago, but hasn't gotten a lot of them built. And that's one of the big challenges that it faces. Um, and this is a project that we've worked on at R Street, um, where you've seen this problem all across the country, really. People want, are starting to appreciate that having a smaller unit that's in the back of a single family home is very gentle density. It's not that scary, all things considered. Um, well, and I think all of us have seen the other side of that coin, which is many neighborhoods I'm sure have experienced a lot of infill where an older house, three older houses in a row, are purchased, torn down, they're scraped, and you get nine units. That's much more disruptive to the fabric in terms of increasing density within that neighborhood than what you're suggesting, correct? Right, it, exactly. Um, adding one unit is less disruptive than scraping and you know, putting in higher density, certainly. Um, but a lot of places have adopted these codes that are just too burdensome. Um, ADUs are a unique part of the housing market where a lot of times these are not built by pros, not built by, um, not just built by the sort of people in this room, but that a lot of people build for themselves, uh, take home equity loans out to build. And because of that, there's a very high potential to scare people off with barriers to entry. They don't know their way around the permitting office. They don't know their way around a zoning code. And so you have to streamline your code down to the bare minimum and then actively produce resources to guide them through that. And places that have done that, places like Santa Cruz, California, which has maybe been the most aggressive place in the country, have seen production of ADU surge. They subsidize them also a little bit. Um, and so that raises another issue. Um, you know, what's always interesting and ironic to point out is that the city that has the most libertarian accessory dwelling unit ordinance in the country is none other than Portland. You know, that famed right wing outpost. But, uh, you know, I, I was talking to the mayor who got that done recently and he said, you know, he put it up and there wasn't a big fuss yet and so they just sort of slid it through without a lot of the additional owner occupancy requirements, without a lot of the parking requirements. You don't have to have any parking requirements, no owner occupancy, anything. You want an accessory dwelling unit, basically you build it and they're good. And so you've seen a surge, far and away the most ADUs being built anywhere in the country are being built in Portland because they just get out of the way. Well, do you think though Portland might also have an issue with their um, density boundaries? I mean, they, they have geographic challenges. They made decisions to you know, uh, protect some farm area that's adjacent to Portland. So part of it, I wonder if they truly have embraced that <laughs> philosophically or if it was sort of that's what was left in terms of the choices. Right, Do you have exactly, about that? exactly. Uh, they have a very strict urban growth boundary and um, uh, Chuck Marone just, uh, I think recirculated a piece he took sort of taking issue with Portland's uh, self-love of how it is done. Um, you're right, it has 
tremendous weird restrictions uh, that urban growth boundary chokes it off and keeps you from continuing to build out. And then they have these very intensive uh, transit-oriented developments where all of a sudden you have um, density just crashing down into a place. Um, and you've had very, you know, rising home values that have been pushing people into all sorts of places. And so ADUs were, you know, one of the only ways they saw to uh, let that go. Um, they also just passed something, and I'm glad you brought this up because it reminded me, they just passed um, a 20% inclusionary zoning ordinance uh, so that multifamily buildings have to set aside 20% of their stock to be at 60% or below of area median income. Did they give them a density bonus as a result of that? Or is it just a mandate? Um, I, I think there's a combination. Okay. Um, but what you've seen from uh, the folks I've talked to out there, there was a big surge just before the uh, inclusionary zoning requirement went into effect. And now all the multifamily architects are scraping for work in other towns because there's been a depression because it dramatically raises the cost of doing that. And inclusionary zoning is really popular and is sometimes inoffensive with sufficient density bonuses. But one of the reasons why I'm very skeptical of inclusionary zoning requirements, and I know Salt Lake is considering them in its uh, housing strategy uh, process right now, is that what I've talked about about the importance of having small actors and the importance of having increments where you develop over time and you have you know, a single family that you maybe break into a duplex and a quad, and then you, you know, build a three-story walk-up. Um, inclusionary zoning falls, you know, races into the arms of the big, uh, where it, in order to make it possible, you have to get more density, and so you have to get even bigger. And um, then you will have more expensive market rate houses uh, I mean, market rate apartments with the truly subsidized stuff. And that, to me, is not how you solve, is not the best way to be solving the sort of in, um, economic segregation that Heath was talking about. It's not to take some, you know, a few poor people and drop them in a luxury building. It's to build communities where you have a housing stock that is diverse by design, and you've built enough of it so that you don't have huge uh, distorted markets where as soon as you build anything, it's going to be snapped up. Um, if you try and do it just by forcing or regulating it into existence, I think it's far less likely you're going to get actual social cohesion in a way that bridges those economic chasms <laughs> that uh, his report pointed out. Yes, so the way you said it. So the firm saw this in the community land trust where they actually own uh, homes in various neighborhoods throughout the city. And these homes are quote unquote sold to uh, people who are uh, either homeless previously or low income the folks. And they go back to by paying uh the fact that there's a mortgage uh, back to the city for those homes. And the whole point is it's supposed to build effectively like a rent kind of situation so that when they sell the home, which they maintain, that some of the city owners have control on it, they can go out and get in their own situation. And the benefit I take of that is if you if you bring people who are uh, in these kinds of difficult situations into communities that are more economically diverse, even if it's a one-off situation. They have the opportunity to build the networks, to build the, 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 uh, the job opportunities, simply by associating with people who have their job opportunities for the goal, uh, in ways that otherwise you can end up with uh, simply affordable housing options that are effectively you know, one building of all affordable housing that they stigmatize as being, well, that's, that's the affordable housing you can stay away from there. And I think that's the program that's in it. I'm not. Not as a conservative, but this is about the idea that the city owns all these homes. 
But I love that they're trying to find ways to integrate folks economically in ways that are beneficial to them and help them to move up the Well, one of the other points that I think, and Jonathan, I think you wrote about this um, in an article you did last year. In North Carolina, I know that they have a, they have instituted a sort of almost a, I hate to say it, but it's sort of a punitive approach to either vacant buildings or vacant land as infill, because what you're getting at is having to do with infill, mm -hmm. smaller scale actors that are coming in and able to infill. I mean, I think Salt Lake City, you know, most of the East Bench, we're not experiencing the kind of um, problems that Portland is, but we know they're not far off. Mm -hmm. We know what our growth is gonna be. We know we're gonna hit those mountains on the other side eventually. I mean, Riverton, Harriman, Bluffdale can, continue to carry some of that, but we know we're gonna to have to look back and see what's happening on the East Bench and in central cities. So my question is um, sort of that kind of approach, and if you've seen that and seen any success in that. Yeah, I mean, it is, um, this gets to the, you know, one of the weird cross-cutting ideological, ideologically cross-cutting dreams, which is the land value tax. Um, of taxing land values instead of, instead of property values. Um, and one of the benefits of that is that, um, you know, you can leave something as just a surface parking lot or a vacant lot, but if it's valuable, you're going to be paying taxes on it, so you might as well build on it. Um, and that's very sensible. Um, I think lots of places would benefit from seeing that implemented. Um, and I, I think I don't know, it, it always gives, you see that from the furthest right to the furthest left, um, people getting on board with the land value tax. And so if, if we could ever actually get this into the mainstream political discussion, you know, maybe tribalism would, you know, lead us to say, you know, oh, if he's for it, I'm against it, but at least there's a chance there. Well, we'll have to call it something other than a tax, I think, and then we might be able to <laughs> uh -huh. so, You know, on that note, I want to promise that we were going to be taking a break, and we want to take the questions that the audience has written on those cards. So we are going to take a brief, brief um, five to seven minute break. And if I could have some help from CNU board members to gather up any cards that have questions, we're going to sort of come back after the break and go right into some of the questions that the audience has. Mm -hmm. We're not going to limit those questions to the, on the card. We do have microphones here, so if something um, sparks a question or an issue that you'd like to raise while we're talking, um, don't hesitate to come down. But let's just take about a five to seven minute break. So while they're getting settled, just uh, one, one last plug on becoming a CNU member. Uh, go to cnuutah.org slash join and we have, uh, you can, for $80, you can become both a chapter patron and national member with uh, all the, the benefits that go along with that. Mostly you get to hang out with really cool people and feel really special and know that you are doing something and you're part of an organization that is making our communities better. So, uh, with that, Dina. Okay, thanks. We had some great questions and far too many. In fact, I'm going to put our speakers on the spot here a little bit. You don't have to do this, but there's no way we're going to get to all these questions. And I'm wondering if you guys would be willing maybe to respond to them in writing or um, if we can pose them at a reception. We're having a little gathering afterwards. I just think sure. these are some really good meaty questions, and I hate that we can't get to all of them tonight. So if there might be a willingness to respond to them in some way, maybe CNU can put it on their website as a blog or... You yeah, can I figure out how to get that That sounds available. like a great idea. Okay, great. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, some uh, local planning ordinances inhibit affordability and destroy, oh, and density. Some state legislatures across the country are discussing forming local jurisdictions to lessen these barriers or take some of that control back. Is that a solution? So I was reading yesterday that Oregon, Oregon's legislature is actually discussing a bill that would preempt local zoning ordinances in the case of developers who want to build affordable housing. And so this really comes down to like how far do we want to take the localism, um, the subsidiarity, uh, which is a very interesting topic and one that I need to think about more. Yeah, this is, I think, one of the most 
interesting questions facing the country today. How about that? I, I'll just throw that out there. Because it really gets to um, the appropriate level of governance. And what we have done for the past uh, you know, 50, 60 years is um, prioritized the absolute closest level of governance so that um, the neighborhood regulates itself, basically. Um, and local people can have great veto power over what their neighbor does with their property. Um, and there is um, a strong case for localism in that. And a lot of this came out of a time when there was far too much centralization. Um, I don't know if anyone here has seen the new Jane Jacobs documentary. Um, but it, I, I saw it recently actually in uh, the West Village, in Greenwich Village, which seemed like the right place to watch it. And you saw a lot of Robert Moses's uh, bulldozing a lot of places, and it required the local community to rise up and stop it. Um, and so they got a lot of veto power uh, rightly. But now we have to look at and confront the very dicey question of what happens when you have a neighbor um, vetoing people from developing their own land? And what happens when you have a neighbor keeping people out of a place? And what is the level of governance that is appropriate to you know, serve the common good? And so Oregon far and away has the most aggressive bill on this that is going through. And I find myself deeply conflicted on it because I am a localist. Yeah. Um, but you also see a number of, especially on the coasts, a number of cities that have gotten so far gone in their, in their um, distorted markets and zoning that they are truly in crisis. And I, I know Salt Lake is approaching crisis level, but the specter of San Francisco is out there to show what happens when um, nothing moves. And in California, they are having that very debate you know, as we speak. There's another watered down preemption bill there as the state tries to force towns to build because the state knows that it has to build housing and somebody has to do it. Well, and it brings up something that you mentioned, Derek, in your opening statements about the need that you see in developers sort of going into the community or getting, I wrote down, kind of getting that community input earlier in the process. I mean, I've served on community councils. I think a lot of people here have probably been active in those, in their neighborhoods. And I, I don't think I've ever met a large scale developer who's enthusiastic about going to a community council meeting or neighborhood meetings. And I, I hate to sort of generalize that because I know I'm wrong. I know there are some that, that don't mind that process, but my experience has been one of you know, gear up, put the shoulder pads on, go in and tell the community what you're trying to do. But I think you, you touched on something really important if you want to sort of expound on it, which is not telling them what they're going to do, but really seeking authentic input about what that local community might need, which I think is very much in keeping with CNU, deep, deep CNU principles. Uh, we want to have at each other and have the other person call us, but we don't really want to talk to the other person. And so, yeah, I, mean, I think that's one of the reasons that's worse, because when you have to do have these conversations with people, where you are generally listening to them, and say, okay, what does the community feel here? I'm a little bit more by how you are more by how you I don't understand what, what you know, the community looks like. When, when people have those conversations, you tend to find all manner of agreement. And things that you can work with. And it's the hesitancy to have that conversation that leads to the vision because we never we never even approach coming together in a form where we can then say, okay, we have these tangible things that we just disagree on, what do we do that? But I can see I can automatically involve here or the person like, well, I actually like this aspect of your development there. And then you have something to go on rather than you know rushing in and saying, okay, here's what I'm doing, and I hope I don't get focused on the room. Uh, and developers should be prepared to come to communities and explain how the developments are going to benefit the community. So it's not just an adversarial thing where, you know, if a developer comes in and says, I want to build a multifamily housing unit, immediately 
community members not just think of oh, some big hideous brick building that is going to be a, a pock on the community. Well, if the developer comes in and explains, no, this is what it's going to look like. I'm going to try to develop it so it, it's in line with you know, the community's values and how the community looks, then that would be a lot easier than yeah, ignoring them. Uh, talk about the Apple, uh, or the Apple orders, right? And they spent a ton of money on this and did not build a huge, big, spectacular high resolution big old crash statement. It said they did something else. And I think that's kind of the question. If, if you're involved in the community, say, I'm going to make a big statement with my development, say, this is what new age function looks like. <laughs> and but it's in a community that doesn't care about that at all. It's in a community that cares about themselves and they want the world to feel like they're what it is. If you come in and say, I'm going to get into that, and, and that's the same matter, because I want to improve your community, help your community, be what it, what it should be, uh, what you want it to be, not something that I don't want to say. Right. And I, what I think is really important is that um, the community doesn't have to be the Right. And what I think is really important is um, a process issue for private actors. Um, a lot of architecture is planned and developed. Um, you know, on a table or on a screen, and it's a building and it's a statement. Um, and, and I don't want far be it from me to uh, blanket smear architects, not at least because I get, I'm guessing I'm outnumbered in this room. But it is important for plans to be developed um, in their context and um, in dialogue with their environment. And we have lost the idea of the public realm as a place. Um, it, it's ironic. At the very same time that we want to regulate our neighbor, we've lost the sense that the street and the facade and everything is, in fact, a part of a public commons. Um, but I, I do want to push back as well, uh, because as I'm sure everyone here knows, um, just going out and having the conversation isn't always enough. Um, and especially when you get to richer and, dare I say, more liberal areas, that's in the statistics, that's in the statistics, um, you end up with a lot of places who say, I am very in favor of this stuff being built in principle, but there's just this one problem. You know, always one more problem if you're trying to build it near me. And in California, you see, you know, California is a great example to use because it's all of our problems magnified. And they just had um, the, and AIDS nonprofit is the biggest uh, NIMBY lobbyist in the city of Los Angeles. And it put on a measure to halt uh, almost all development in the city because they feared that there was going to be some development in Hollywood that would stand between their headquarters and the Hollywood sign. And that's a problem. Um, fortunately, it was uh, put down in large part thanks to a lot of community activists in an organization called Abundant LA who said, we need housing, we need this stuff to happen, and we need building everywhere. But you can also have places, there's another area in Pasadena, I think, where I read a specific story of a Swedish developer who was coming in to develop you know, mixed use, grocery store on the first floor, some apartments above. And the very wealthy community has a very long history of extorting developers. And that's what it is. Uh, you know, they come in and they say, OK, well, it's nice that you want to build that. Um, but if you don't want us to sue you via CEQA, their environmental regulation, for 30 years, you're going to need to spend uh, $1.5 million here and devote another $3 million into this community fund that pays us each six figures. Um, and he walked out of that meeting and remarked to a reporter, he, he couldn't believe he was in a first world country. It, it, the shakedown was something he didn't think happened in a first world country. And so we have to be able to take hard governance questions of where, um, where should the decisions be and where do we have checks on each other? 
Because that's one of the great lessons that is built into our national governing structure, the idea that we always have checks and balances among each other. I think that thinking often has been too little applied down to the structures in which we govern each other more locally. Um, and with regards to housing, it may be that it's needed. Um, this is a good question that's going to uh, have a little bit of a couple of points to it. Conservatives would argue government should not be in the business of housing. How can we shift responsibility for affordable housing from government to private enterprise? But I want to bring up a couple of um, points that I think also come into play with this topic. And that is, um, since the 1960s, the share of renters paying more than 30% of their income for rent has more than doubled to almost 49%. For the Salt Lake metro area, the area median monthly housing cost is $930. And renters paying more than 30% of their income in rent is up to 46%. 20% of those folks pay more than 50% in rent. So what I'm getting at is I, I, I can understand this question of, of government not being in the business of affordable housing. But how do you deal with those market gaps? If you, if you are looking at a complete free market approach and your wages are not keeping pace with your housing costs, which we know um, have risen, um, area, uh, excuse me, housing, household income, excuse me, increased by 18% since 1960. But the inflation adjusted rent went up by 64%. So how can we take it away from subsidies of government, which you had all talked about a little bit before, touched on or alluded to, and really put it in the realm of free market when you're looking at those kinds of wage problems? Well, I think it's in the beginning of that, as you have a question, is recognizing the long-term nature of all of those stuff. But I mean, the place where we are today in the most recent suburban development is probably going to be 40 to 50, 60 years, right? And so, a question at that level is probably uh, several of them might make it answer, right? Uh, which means that we don't have all the answers today because we can't pursue that much in the future. But I think it begins with things like, uh, again, you know, financial regulation, as it is the housing sector, that the first line is the cost. Because one reason why housing costs are not so much is because those who finance, the housing developments don't have to pay off all, all, all the costs of those buildings in many cases, or uh, not the ones that have financing. And so they can take a lot more risk than they probably should. Uh, and you don't have that regular, and so the community say, this is how much risk you can take. That's kind of what God ranked from you, right? So that's the thing we'll we'll decide a free item on how much risk you think you can take. And so then we ought to, we ought to say, you know what, you're going to suffer the, the consequences of taking a human risk. And then it's up to you to figure out, and if you do, then we're going to have a reasonable process to get you, get you out uh, that, that's going to effectively disrupt your business um, and not get the tax that you pay for. So I think it starts with things like that. I don't know if fundamental issues what I'm getting at. And maybe more broadly, the culture uh, and the government's culture, for instance. So one reason why the government uh, is involved in housing is it sees so culturally as, uh, and this is true uh, on both sides of the political aisle, right? George W. Bush was very good on home ownership. He made sure his policy reflected the government getting involved in encouraging home ownership. And is that bad necessarily? It's not the it depends on how you do it. But it creates a culture that says the government's job is to make sure that you are in a good home. Well, it doesn't matter what your politics are, we don't that. And also, if you want the free market to basically get government out of the business of providing housing, you need to unleash the free market to be able to provide housing at more affordable price levels. So um, when early 1900s, we had a bunch of immigrants coming from Europe who had basically nothing, they were able to build homes in cities. Um, they didn't have government subsidies. Um, obviously, they weren't always the best quality, and we don't want to have the, the same quality of those houses, but there's a lot of things we can do to um, trim our building codes, get rid of all these parking requirements, all these 
requirements that the government places on developers that increase the cost of housing. If you want the private market to supply housing at more affordable rates, make it cheaper to build housing. And I'm not saying get rid of all government regulations, because obviously we need to make sure people are safe and these houses are, are structurally sound, but there's a lot that we can trim from building codes that would make housing a lot cheaper to build and therefore a lot more affordable for lower income people. Yeah, and so um, one thing that's important to say is that you are never, and this is a consensus agreement, you are never going to get to a place where uh, the market produces 100% of housing for all people if you have the sort of codes that we talk about of wanting there to be a certain level of fire safety, a certain level of uh, housing safety and everything like that. Energy and, efficiency. Right, exactly. And so there's going to be a government create, you know, a government created floor. And so there's going to be a government role for, um, you know, taking up that question. But we have a sizable gap right now between that basic floor and the operational floor in which we live now. Um, and one of my priorities is um, digging into a lot of the history that you talked about and showing all of the different housing forms that we used to build that were more affordable. Um, the, you know, the ADU is one and is a great one and is, you know, the starting point. But it's, uh, the accessory dwelling unit isn't uh, the only thing we've regulated out of existence. Um, you know, the single resident occupancy hotel, the SRO, is nobody's favorite uh, housing structure. And, but we have seen a, you know, essential almost eradication of them as a housing form in the United States, in North America. Um, Vancouver is one of the few places in North America where it has not completely disappeared. Um, but there's a famous story of in the 80s when they were sort of catching up with a lot of the zoning fashion. There was one particular neighborhood in East Vancouver, I believe, that had very high concentration of uh, SROs. Um, it had among the lowest um, homeless population in the city. In the 80s, they caught up. They got rid of all of those, you know, SROs that um, you know, good upstanding people like us came in and said, no, this, you know, people shouldn't have to live without, you know, having an entire home in a box, like an apartment. Um, and I'm sure, you know, there were issues present in those SROs themselves. But when they got rid of them, like happened when you saw the, um, you know, redevelopment and urban renewal here in the U.S., they got rid of them. There wasn't as much of an emphasis on you know, how to house those people. They got rid of the SROs and the homeless population ticked right up. And so what's important is creating as many housing units that have as many low price points as possible. And there may be a role for subsidies and you know, having um, you know, I'm a bigger fan of having uh, housing vouchers so that you can have pro people access the private market rather than publicly produced housing because, you know, it's not a core competency of government to get into the construction business and it does it at exorbitant cost. Whereas if you relax a lot of these markets and allow micro units and, um, you know, core court, um, cottage courts, and everything like that, you can create smaller units which rent for cheaper and cover a lot more of the spectrum naturally rather than relying on very complex uh, government subsidies. Okay, we are actually running out of time, and I apologize, we had some excellent questions, and like I said, I'm going to encourage the CNU board to consider a way that we can publish those questions and ask for your responses. But I did ask the three panelists if they would be willing to just take a minute or two and kind of provide some closing remarks. They could be um, sort of what you have thought about today that may be different. It could be sort of the Hail Mary, what Utah should be doing 
the very next day if we all walk out the store and want to try to make change. The other is maybe another topic that we all should think about um, as we go forward. So I'm going to give you each just about a minute, a minute and a half for closing remarks. And then I just wanted to say that CNU Utah is hosting a gathering with our panelists just across the atrium downstairs in one of the conference rooms. So follow the path of individuals going. And again, I just want to thank our sponsors, WSP, the Daybreak Communities, and the College of City and Metropolitan Planning at the University of Utah. But I'll turn the time back over to you, gentlemen. All right. Um, so, so thank you again for hosting this. This has been a wonderful time. I've very much enjoyed it. Uh, we've, t we've gotten a lot into the weeds and particular issues. And so I'll just close remarking on uh, the role of conservative values in this. And what I think it's important to recognize and what I've found in my work is though a lot of urban concerns are often occupied uh, and advocated for by people left of center, the importance of a walkable community is about the strength of a community and is about the sustainability of that community. A lot of people think of sustainability as just about the environment and particularly in places like Utah, it's important to be cognizant of your water use and uh, modes of sustainability like that. But traditional development is also about fiscal sustainability. It pays for itself to have a lot more people along a certain segment of pipe. Um, to run it out and disperse it, you're almost always going to end up upside down. And so as conservatives finally, I think, get back into this discussion where we've unfortunately let it you know, left it alone for too long, it's important to recognize that affordable housing and the issues of community form are both questions of how you build people, how you build things for people to come together, and how you build things so that people can pay for them for generations to come. Uh, yeah, thanks again for hosting this. I've had a lot of fun um, being part of this panel. Um, so back in D.C. in Senator Lee's office, we often talk about the Utah model. Um, Senator Lee talks about this a lot in his speeches. Um, it's because Utah does a lot of things exceptionally well that other states just haven't quite figured out. Um, so just last week, for example, we had a hearing in the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and Senator Lee chaired this hearing. And um, the purpose of the hearing was to highlight collaborative partnerships between the federal government and state governments. And so we had witnesses from the Forest Service, from the Bureau of Land Management. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows Tyler Thompson. Um, he's from Utah's Department of Natural Resources. Um, and we also had a witness from Idaho. And all of the witnesses, even the Idaho witness, were just gushing about Utah's ability to create collaborative partnerships not only within the state, but also with the federal government. Um, Utah has just figured out how to work together and how to solve solutions locally. Um, not with top-down mandates, but through bottom-up grassroots um, input from a wide variety of, of stakeholders. Um, and so I have no doubt that Utah is going to be a leader on this housing issue, much like it is with most other issues. Um, and so, as someone who eventually wants to move back to Utah, um, I am very much looking forward to what Utah does, and um, yeah, just, just excited to see what, what Utah has in store for the rest of the country. First, and this is an open issue, but looking at how our relationship with the whether we build roads And, and then secondly, reach out to someone who disagrees with you on this issue and you can dialogue about it. And honestly, like a real dialogue about it. It was really in our world that it hasn't happened very often. And on an issue like this, it feels useful. Because everybody wants more of the world and how it's accomplished for people. And so I think if we reach out to people who are conservative, I don't know if we're conservative about how we can find solutions. I think we're going to find solutions. And maybe we can find it in the basic because we'll pull off each other's ideas rather than the 